Good morning, everyone. This is the third in a row uh, of dedicated lectures. Um, for those of you who haven't attended the other ones, don't worry, I'm not going to base this one on the previous ones, so you, they are totally independent. But just for the flow of information, people have been taken this morning through an introduction of LHC and the big discovery at this machine, the Higgs. They have been explained why the Higgs has a direct impact to our society. They have been shown the mystery of cosmology, and now my task here is to talk about particles in medicine. And as you see, my affiliation is actually not with CERN, it's with uh, the University of Hamburg in Germany. So I give you a bit of my background to start with, just to say why the hell are you standing in front of us talking to us from a CERN perspective. Well, I actually started my diploma thesis here in Geneva uh, a few years ago. Um, I was designing magnets, uh, corrector magnets for the LHC. A tiny little magnet that helps the beam to orbit in this 27 kilometers long accelerator. And given the big success of LHC, I assume my uh, diploma work didn't screw it up, at least, totally. Um, I moved then to my PhD um, studies at Nikkev in Amsterdam. And since then, basically, I've been developing detectors. So I have a 10 years long experience in developing different type of detectors. Detecting particles is my job. I became professor of experimental particle physics at the University of Hamburg. But I remain connected, as all the particle physicists in the world are, to CERN. Everybody around the world doing particle physics has to do with CERN, and in particular through two major high energy physics experiments, CMS, you might end up visiting the pit down there today. And for the future machine, the one that might uh, succeed the LHC in the future, so a linear collider, I'm also active in developing detectors. And here are my two affiliations to CERN on medical projects. And I will mention these two projects uh, in, in my slides and you will see a bit about what they are, and I'm strongly uh, collaborating with the coordinating groups that are based here at CERN. That's why I'm talking to you today about particles in medicine. You are here at CERN today. You came most likely to learn something about the Higgs, but you decided to attend also this lecture that is about the question, what is the impact of particle research in our world, and in particular from a perspective of medicine. So I'll try to answer this question, and I'll try to tell you my opinion, obviously, about how physics has an impact in, on medicine. Let me get started by giving standard numbers, some numbers that might trickle your interest, make you curious to know and to learn more about this uh, subject. Um, I, I'm not sure actually which number is correct. I think I, I messed it up, but uh, let's say twice as many particle accelerators exist around the world today. I, I believe it's more 30,000. Anyhow, out of this huge amount of accelerators, about 50% of them are used in medicine for medical application. The rest are used in industry. And a very tiny fraction, say around CERN here, you might find something less than 20 particle accelerators. And this is the biggest facility with particle accelerators for uh, physics. Um, all over, I think, 200 accelerators exist for fundamental research. The rest is all already applied, either to medicine or to industry. Medicine accelerators are used in two ways, either in imaging or therapy and I'll tell you about these two options. In the world today, there are about 20 million people each year that undergo diagnostics using radiopharmaceuticals. I'll tell you what that is. Five billion x-rays exams are performed every day in the world. About half of all the cancer patients are treated with radiotherapy. And I'll tell you more also about that. Those are just thick words. 
that should make you think. And I'll try to tell you why these stick boards are related to physics. So my idea today is to show you synergy between medicine and physics, as I said. And I obviously have to constrain this immense field to something manageable in 45 minutes. So I'll focus on medical imaging and radiotherapy that are two very important disciplines in medicine. I could have taken laser therapy, surgical tools, telesurgery, uh, materials, new, novel materials for, for prosthesis, or uh, personalized therapy, nano carriers, or similars. Um, they all have direct links to physics, but I have to say these two topics are more directly connected to the fields of CERN, namely detector, accelerator, and computing. So I'll take it from here. Let me start very fundamental to explain about medical imaging, what, do we, uh, what technologies are available. So medical imaging is a way to look inside the human body, a non-invasive or semi-invasive way to look inside the human body. That is, you can also cut the human body and look inside, but that's not what we want to do with uh, medical imaging. There are two techniques widely used. One is transmission and one is emission. Transmission works on the principle that you have a source of particles you shoot through a body. Use the fact that different particles, uh, um, that particles are absorbed in a different way by different densities in the body. And by that you obtain an anatomical structure, a picture of the anatomical structure of the body. Emission works on the principle that you have to inject a source inside the human body. This source will distribute in the human body depending on the functionality of the cells in the human body. And then you measure the rate of emission, how many particles are emitted from which part of the body. And that will tell you about the concentration of particles and, and uh, at the end the, of the functionality activity of the cells of the body. There is one very important piece of physics that you have to know to understand all the rest of medical imaging, and that is the photon attenuation in biological tissues. Take a particle, I take here a photon for an, uh, for an example, take a photon with a given energy. And now we use to express energies in high energy physics in kilo electron volt, thousands of electron volts. An electron volt or a volt is the equivalent of a, a battery, right? 1.5 volts is one of these little things. So I say 150 kilo electron volt is about uh, 100,000 of these little batteries. It's the type of energy that we store in a single photon. So take this photon, and now a photon of roughly 30 or 40 kilo electron volts will have a very different probability of being absorbed in different tissues. Take the bone here with larger probability, denser material, muscles, or soft tissues like water. This is the ideal situation to perform x-rays. So if you go to a dentist today and you take a picture of your teeth, you are going to probably uh, use th uh, 30 ki uh, kilo electron volt photons. That gives the best contrast between the different materials in the body. Here, the no domain of nuclear medicine, photons emitted uh, by decay of sub substances, uh, the typical energies are much higher, from 100 to 500 uh, kilo electron volt. And this is the regime of nuclear medicine. And I will show you a couple of pictures where you will not be able to see so clearly the structure of the human body, the difference between the different uh, media, bone, muscles, soft tissues. But you will see many other informations that wouldn't be possible otherwise. Um, let me stress one more important thing about emission uh, images. This is based on the successful development of radiopharmaceuticals. Those are radioactive substances that can be injected in the human body and that will fix particularly to one defined tissue or organ. This is very important. They will fix only to this one organ or this one tissue. There are a lot of isotopes in nature, radioactive isotopes, that you can find. 
uranium is a very uh, known one. You can find strontium, thorium. They exist in nature. Unfortunately, they have a very long lifetime. They are long-lived. Sure enough, they are around since the uh, formation of our galaxy in order to be still available. So they are not good tracers to be injected in the human body because you can imagine I inject it today, it will live for as long as the universe or as long as the galaxy life. Uh, this is not very efficient way. What I want is an isotope that is useful for the time of an intervention and then decays uh, very shortly after and disappears from the human body. So something that has a short lifetime um, basically as long as the image uh, time. Clearly this does not exist in nature. It has, if it did exist, it has decayed already, so I have to produce it. And I have to produce it in uh, specific machines, in specific accelerators uh, that allow me to produce this isotope and then combine it chemically to a substance, to a molecule, a tracer we call it, um, that fixes to a specific organ or to a specific disease. If I want to, um, to investigate the brain or I want to investigate the liver, I need a different type of substance that goes specifically to that organ. Nowadays, uh, about 80% of nuclear medicine procedures are performed using technetium. Technetium-99 is a very nice element. It comes from uh, the decay chain of uh, uh, uranium, from fission of uranium. It has to be produced at nuclear reactors. You don't get it uh, otherwise. But it has a very short lifetime, six hours, comparable with the type of exams. And um, it emits 140 keV photons. So these photons can be used to detect. Um, alternative to photon, one can also use positron, or photons coming from the annihilation of positrons and electrons. So the history of positron emission tomography which is another wild-use technique in nuclear medicine, starts obviously uh, with the postulation of the existence of the positron itself, or if you wish, the antimatter partner of the electron. And that has been done by Paul Dirac in uh, 1928. Soon thereafter, Anderson has discovered the positron in this very famous uh, single-shot event, different from the discovery of the Higgs, where it Still with 700 events, we haven't got it completely. The positron is, was quite easy to identify. It was clearly predicted, and this is the track that shows that is an antimatter of the, of the electron. Still, it took about 20 years from the discovery of the positron for the first team in the Massachusetts hospital to use the annihilation of electron and positron in the medical oriented field. So these 20 years for physics were 20 very rich years where uh, positron has been studied in many different ways, but were 20 years needed for the first team to think, okay, this positron exists, let's use it for medicine. And if you turn that to the Higgs example nowadays, when can we use the Higgs in a hospital? Well, maybe uh, not even in 20 years, but it takes time and it takes creati creativity, invention, to make use of a discovery. Also in the 30s, an Italian uh, radiologist was developing the method, the mathematical approach to tomography. I'll come to that in a moment, what it means. It's a complicated methodology, uh, mathematical approach to, uh, to create images. The thing was, at that time, it was not possible to compute fast enough um, tomographic pictures, so um, he had to wait another 40 years until computing was developed fast enough and the, mini, the first mini computers became available in order to actually um, make use of tomography. So what is tomography? I try to give a very brief explanation. I start with the, the opposite of tomography, which is projection. Projection of a three-dimensional object, let's say a patient, is a typical x-ray picture where you project the three-dimensional object on a two-dimensional Fill. By that, obviously, you lose information. You reduce one dimension. And so imagine that you take the projection from this angle. You still can resolve the inside structure. But when you take the projection from this angle, one part of the information is hidden by the larger object. And you don't see that there are two balls in this example. 
this is clear, that's the reduction of information. So here comes tomography. Tomography is the idea of taking pictures of this kind from all over around, rotate completely the projection field and um, acquire as many as possible, and then with a mathematical transformation, reduce this number of projections to a slice or the reconstruction of a slice of the human body. I don't show you the mathematics, it's just a very tough computing, uh, intense computing technique that requires a lot of uh, computational power, but in the end you are able to make slice images of the body without cutting the body itself, which was, be, would be disadvantageous. Um, one more step. In the 60s, in the Brookhaven Laboratory, the first single plane PET scanner was developed. Here in Geneva, uh, activity was also following, in particular in the 80s, uh, with David Townsend and at the university, uh, sorry, at the, at the hospital um, of Geneva and employed by CERN, obviously. He pushed the development of PET scanner significantly. One more step was needed. I told you about radio tracers. Um, something had to be developed, chemically developed, that could be injected in the body to carry the positron inside the body. And the first developments were done by uh, Joanna Fowler here um, and her team who developed this very complex molecule, FDG, fluorodexoglucose, um, which is one of the most, actually the most used molecule in order to transport a beta emitter or a positron carrier inside the human body. And the first tests were done at the early 80s. Um, these are the first detectors in the 80s and 90s that were used purely for research as research tools. You can see an assembly of detectors in a circular form, which will have to become later on the, the nowadays uh, shape of many of these detector in hospitals, and at the same time yeah, uh, at CERN in the, in the 90s, the construction of the opal detector at the lab experiment was going on. And yet the human has nothing to do f with medicine, the human was just fixing the crystals inside this big detector, you see the difference in scale of detector. We were busy, well, actually not me at that age, but uh, CERN was busy developing very sophisticated high technology detectors for particle physics that resembled very much the one um, used in medicine. In, uh, from the 2000s, uh, from, from this century on, the uh, standard technique for PET was, is already established as a, a diagnostic tool in, in large hospitals. And you see here an array of this uh, uh, type of detector detecting the process of annihilation of positrons with electrons in the body emitting two photons. I told you already the energy of the photons is something close to 250 times battery energy, but that is maybe not so uh, impressive. We stop the photon in a crystal, so one of these blue elements here is a orga inorganic crystal, sorry. The photon is stopped, its energy is converted into optical photons flash of light and we measure a flash of light. We do that for both photons. We reconstruct lines in complicated processing uh, tools and we finally manage to reconstruct pictures of the slice of a slice of a human body, in this case a brain. And that for many different type of pathologies uh, or interesting um, studies like the uh, blood flow, oxygen usage of different uh, part of the brain uh, glucose metabolisms and so on. Now, this is the building block, this is the building element of such a detector made of crystals, made of photodetectors, made of uh, readout electronics. If you break a big uh, PET detector into pieces, you will find finally this part here. This is all um, relatively old technology. Most commercial PET scanners nowadays are based on 30 years old technologies, which already at that point were the spin-off, the application of high energy physics technology into medicine. Meantime, CERN and the other labs working on detector development for LHC, for instance, have made much more. 
You see here a production of crystals for the CMS electromagnetic calorimeter. This has significantly pushed the knowledge on crystal development. Photodetectors have also improved. This is the large, the long photodetector um, vacuum tube that you can use in standard PET detectors. This is nowadays silicon based. So in general, high energy physics pushes particle detector and readout electronics beyond the state of the art to, new, to achieve new resolution, to achieve new speed, new granularity. This has a clear impact to medicine. One step more had to be made. I showed you the example of positron emission tomography. I showed you the example of X-ray uh, or computed tomography if you start to rotate the X-rays around the body. Um, pushed by actually an idea developed here in Geneva between CERN and the Cantonal Hospital, people realized that fusing the information of the perfect anatomical description from computer tomography and the, the information, the, the localization of tumors provided by PET, sorry, this one here, <laughs> the functional image of PET, you could reach a much better knowledge of the positioning of tumoral cells. This is the fusion of two different uh, ways of looking at the body, the localized uh, anatomical information and the functional information. And if you put them to together, you always win. And this is true for many different technologies. You can fuse functional imaging techniques and anatomical imaging techniques in many different ways. Nowadays, just to give you some numbers, there are about one, uh, one million PET or uh, image, uh, nuclear image um, pictures taken per year in the US and a large portion of them is a combined PET CT. So people have realized the importance of combining this imaging. You win in specificity, in sensitivity, you have a better reconstruction, so it's clear that the two images have been fused. Now to give you some uh, insight from these techniques, what is nowadays realized is this sequential PET CT uh, techniques where the patient has to pass through let's say first the CT scanner and subsequently to the PET scanner. They are two different devices. The patient is passed through the one and the other in the same, maintaining the same position so as not to alter the physiological uh, positioning of all the organs. This is the widely used uh, system. It's in itself relatively simple because you had the CT scanner, you had the PET scanner, you put them one after the other and the bed slides through. Some disadvantages, the very high radiation dose, CT in itself, computer tomography, is a large amount of x-ray taken at large angles, so covering the entire patient from different angles. It clearly adds a quite high radiation dose to the patient, whereas PET in itself is about twice as much as the natural radiation, what you get from nature. So in itself, PET is not contributing much to the radiation scan. This is a disadvantage. Sequential scanning is also not 100% optimal because there could be a movement of the patient between position one and position two. The patient is breathing, the patient might be a bit uncomfortable and move. So this deteriorates the image. Just some numbers if you're interested. A PET CT scan takes typically 45 minutes to be accomplished, but for the hospital, one has to consider preparation and after. Um, intervention, so typically two to three hours per patient have to be considered, and they all cost about 2,000 euro per scan. An alternative, I haven't discussed this, but MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, is another way of producing um, anatomical information. It works um, with the usage of a strong magnetic field and a gradient field around the patient. So magnetic resonant, uh, resonant imaging could be an alternative, a direct alternative uh, to uh, computer tomography with the advantage that no radiation is involved. So there is a clear advantage of reduction of this uh, 30 millisievert dose to the patient. Um, the disadvantage here, if you see it from a detector development point of view, putting a detector inside the magnetic field is always a problem. 
Electronics is an, normally an enemy of magnetic fields and the other way around. The magnetic field will be distorted by cables. And on the other hand, the, the magnetic field will affect the operation of electronics inside the field itself. So it's very complex to put a detector inside a magnetic field and having it working with the high precision needed for this type of scan. But high energy physics has solved this problem already. We have CMS, we have ATLAS, we have other uh, high energy physics detectors around the world which work on the principle that part of the detector has to be inside the magnetic field. Part of the electronic is running inside the magnetic field. And so we have overcome in the many years many of these problems. And this is why nowadays it's possible to conceive putting a PET detector, a positron emission tomography scanner, inside a large magnetic bore and have the patient passing through them both at the same time. Now you have the, 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 you have the advantage, sorry, you have the advantage that the patient is at the same time in both detectors. And so there is no movement between the one and the other picture. And you have the clear advantage of less dose. So this is clearly an improvement that was possible, an achievement that was possible thanks to the improvements in high energy physics. Um, I'm going to highlight a couple of uh, uh, contribution of CERN, to di direct contribution of CERN, so direct project where CERN is directly involved in um, medical physics. The first one is clear PEMSONIC. Um, I told you the fusion of these both imaging modalities is fundamental to improve detection of tumors, for instance. The functional imaging comes very often always from PET, but the, um, the anatomical information can also be taken from ultrasound. And this has, has the advantage, again, ultrasound is a completely non-invasive uh, technique, no radiation given to the patient. It's also very local, very localized. So in the case of uh, mammography uh, screening, for instance, it offers very many advantages. Smaller, um, smaller device, if you wish. The, the patient does not have to enter one of these big bore, which is always a bit shocking from the point of view uh, of the handling of the patient. So the fusion of ultrasound and PET is seen as a very good advantage for some special tumor type. And CERN has developed such a tool and tested it already extensively at the Timone Hospital in Marseille. And uh, since this month, actually, the tool has been moved in Milano for a large clinical test. This is the, uh, the validation case where you compare the same tumor um, in a, in a C PET CT scan and through this ultrasound and PET combination, which is the clear PET PEM uh, device. And this offers the possibility to identify the uh, multifocal lesions. So this tumor that is seen as one unique uh, blob in the PET CT scan is recognized as to be a multifocal um, lesion with this tool. And this is extremely important for the type of uh, treatment this patient will uh, undergo. So the staging of the patient foresees that in this case, first the patient will get uh, chemotherapy and then uh, mesectomy, so the, the aspartation of the tumor. Another one of these possible combinations, and then going again more in the direction of focus imaging for a specific organ, is the fusion of an endoscopic PET and ultrasound. Now, endoscopic means you have a tool that is sitting on an endoscope and enters the human body via one of the natural orifices. So one of the opening of our body. And if you can fix a detector on that, you can reach a position very close to the organ under study. In this case, I show you the case of the pancreas, which can be reached, this is the yellow pancreas, it can, it, it can be reached by um, putting an endoscope here inside the stomach. Pancreas is the fourth cause, or pancreas tumor, sorry, is the fourth cause of death uh, in the world to, due to cancer. So it's one of the most critical uh, and, and difficult to detect type of tumors. And if we can attack it by uh, going much closer and having a much better resolution on very small tumors um, information in the pancreas, we can have an early detection of such a disease. PET works always in co coincidence between two detectors. You have to detect the two 
photons uh, flying 180 degrees aside on a line, and so you will need also a second detector which is sitting outside the patient to make a coincidence. But here the, the thing to appreciate for you is really the miniaturization needed to bring a detector that normally makes up one of this big ring around the human body to bring it inside the human body, miniaturized at the level of five euro cents. And here making up again this typical PET detector with crystals and photo detectors sitting at the bottom. I think this is a piece of art in itself, the fact that nowadays we are able to produce crystals of 800 micron in size, uh, 10 millimeter in length, and couple them singularly to a photo detector. These are achievements, jewelry type, that's why Switzerland is so important in this uh, development. It's, it's a piece of jewelry that you have to assemble on the tip of an endoscope. I covered a bit of medical imaging. I gave you a couple of views of where particle physics has strongly made an impact on the development of detectors for medical imaging. And now I want to switch to radiotherapy. After you have seen the cancer cells, you want to treat them. And how radiotherapy works, it's a kind of surgery performed with particles, with single particles, to kill or disable malignant cells from tumor. And the idea is that you bombard cells using either charged or neutral particles. You want to sterilize these cells by cutting the DNA, not only by uh, removing a small part, but really cutting through the DNA that causes the multiplication of these cells. In order to do that, you can use many different particle types, from X-ray to electrons, neutron, and most, most recently also proton and charge ion uh, accelerators have been developed in order to perform this surgery. It's a microsurgery inside the body without cutting the body. Now, the best and suitable particle depends on the type uh, of, of organ that you want to reach, on the depth of the organ that you want to reach, and the type of cell that you want to destroy. There are many different particle types, as I said. They are all available to us because we have accelerators accelerating and providing this particle at the right energy, but then we still have to choose which one we need. This is a plot of the depth in a volume of water, let's say, and this is the uh, relative dose deposited by a given particle in depth. I had... Uh, this sketch of the human body uh, superimposed, a typical European human is something like uh, uh, 15 to 20 centimeter deep. For the Americans, you always have to use a bit larger or uh, machines or more energetic beams. It's unfortunately not a joke, it's reality. <laughs> the companies are <laughs> building special American market machines and special European market machine to make the difference, but this is a uh, True story. Uh, anyhow, the, the idea is that in the depth of the patient, you want to deposit those, and you want to deposit those in such a way that you kill, most likely, the tumoral cells and not the good ones. And you can see already the distinction between um, electrons and photon energy deposition. Oops, sorry. Electron and photon energy deposition starts almost immediately at the entrance uh, of the body and continues for uh, much longer depth. Protons and heavy ions are shown here, deposit very little dose or energy along their path, and then all of a sudden deposit all their energy in a specific depth, and the depth can be controlled by tuning the energy of these particles. So that if you decide to scan, in this case, uh, the brain of a patient with x-rays or with protons, you will have these two different type of energy depositions. In this case, the red stays for, uh, for high energy deposition and then it decreases uh, to lighter color. The majority of the energy will be deposited here in front. In the case of proton, you can tune proton energy such that the energy is deposited here at this point. And then when you turn the beam all over around the brain and you inject 
particles from many different directions, you can cover the entire uh, carcinoma area here from different directions, and in case of proton, you will not damage or you will not touch the uh, back, back part of the skull, which is very delicate for many uh, different activities. Um, many discussions uh, are ongoing on the uh, utility of protons and heavy ions, and maybe I just stress one difference or two differences uh, between the two. This is the same plot as I shown before, the uh, dose deposited as a function of depth, and in both cases of protons and heavy ions, you have this clear peak, it's called Bragg peak, is the deposition of the dose in a very localized um, range. In the case of carbon, you have this fragmentation tail, the so-called fragmentation tail. Carbon can break up into um, sub-products, among which also protons, and continue to deposit energy or dose after, uh, after this sharp peak. On the other end, um, so in this case, protons have a much better defined end point. On the other end, protons are uh, opening up broader. So if you inject a beam of proton, which is very well collimated, the lateral opening will be broader for the proton case as for heavy ion case. So if you want to have a very focused beam of particles to avoid the neighboring organs that you want to save, carbon is much better focused. And in the end, what you're going to do in order to cover a large uh, tumor, which is typically a few centimeters, you're going to scan this type of beams at many different positions, start with the most remote positions and come closer in a rasta scan, what is called a rasta scan of the tumor, to cover the entire area. And this scan that adds up those over a few centimeters uh, is done by decreasing the energy. So you see I have to have an accelerator that provides either proton or carbon uh, ions that accelerates them to the energy I require that tunes the energy, scans the position, and tunes the energy by covering uh, the, entire, uh, the entire tumor. So this is basically a very high sophisticated accelerator of the same kind as used in a machine that you are about to visit. So the old technique of steering the beam and controlling the beam is very similar. This is how particles are produced. X-ray and electrons are typically produced in relatively small uh, linear accelerators. This is a typical X-ray uh, therapy uh, device where the X-rays are actually accelerated here in the tube. Here are the control panel uh, for, for, the, for the tuning at the beginning. So it's a sort of computer tomography um, tool which allows to make the first the diagnostic and then uh, uh, the planning of the therapy. Protons and ions are produced in circular accelerators. Something of this size uh, is sufficient to produce a few MeV um, of, of, uh, of protons, for instance. They are called cyclotrons, and you can actually visit the first cyclotrons around here at CERN, so it's quite interesting to make the connection. They are still using perfectly the same technology as the one developed here. Um, about 40 adron therapy centers are existing today in the world. They require energy slightly uh, higher than the energy needed to, do, to, to produce radioisotopes. So you have to increase the proton or um, ion energy in order to treat patients up to 200 uh, MeV or so. Um, in order to build more of them, you need innovative and affordable designs. With the designs we have today, these machines are much too expensive still. And there is where we, high energy physicists, have to work to make it possible that every hospital can be equipped with such a complex uh, accelerating uh, facility. This is a case of Heidelberg, the, Adron, the ion therapy center in Heidelberg. Here's the main accelerator that accelerates either proton or carbon ions at the moment. And this is the delivery system. It looks very, very familiar to me if I think of the delivery system at uh, test beams here at CERN. In each of these rooms, instead of uh, being a high energy physics experiment, is a human, is a patient sitting on a bed. And these are the straight line delivery system. This is a huge gantry in itself, an accelerator. Uh, that rotates, that steers the beam around and rotates the beam around the patient. 
The idea is to keep the patient in a stable position and rotate the beam around it. You would think it's much more convenient to rotate the patient because it's much lighter. Unfortunately, the relaxation time of the body, of the, of the organ inside the patient, make it such that if I rotate the patient, the organs will vibrate inside the human, inside the water, for several seconds, making it impossible to have a treatment at the millimeter level precision if I don't know what is going on inside. So the patient has to be fixed, and only then I can achieve the very high precision of the treatment that is needed. So I need to build something that is 600 tons um, and, and so big in order to rotate the beam around the patient for a best treatment. Um, CERN is pioneering, as usual, uh, uh, new technology, and also in this case, CERN is pioneering the design of dedicated medical accelerators, aside of the big <laughs> accelerators uh, that obviously are needed for high energy physics here, proton and ion. A booster, this is a very interesting uh, idea. Many um, medical hospitals have already the 30 MeV cyclotron needed to produce isotopes locally. I told you isotopes can only, the, the one relevant for medicine, are only living few hours, so it's much convenient to produce them in situ and apply them to the patients instead of importing them from far away. So you produce them already in situ by uh, these uh, low energy cyclotrons, but in order to use the cyclotrons and the beams for medical treatment in therapy, you need to boost the energy, to accelerate the energy up to 200 MeV. And this is the idea of this new machine uh, developed through CERN. And finally, a new idea of reusing the Isolde uh, beam line here at CERN, on site, you can visit it, it's not far away from here, for medical uh, purposes, producing innovative isotopes I told you the example of FDG, which is one of the most standard ones using uh, fluorine 18, but you can think of many other isotopes to be connected to molecules in a bound in a better way, reaching new organs that normally cannot be reached with uh, FDG or are not specific enough. Um, targeted alpha therapies and innovative protocols. And if you want to take home a word that you can Google, you can Google Terranostic. I also had to Google it the first time I saw it. This is uh, in the direction of uh, therapy and diagnostic together or personalized medicine, namely for every single patient, the best diagnosis and the best therapy depend, uh, adjusted to a specific uh, case. And this is probably medicine of the future. This is the medicine type where every single patient will go to a hospital and be treated according to his specific symptom, collecting from the medical doctor who saw him the first time all his history on a little chippy card carried uh, on, on the human, uh, basically. And exactly because, uh, according to this specific symptom, the patient will be treated. This still requires quite a lot to go and requires new tools and a variety of tools, a variety large enough that can address every single possible problematics or symptom in a patient. Okay. I took you through this journey. My task, my idea was to find an answer to the question, what is the impact of particle research in our world? I hope I showed you that discovery is fundamental. Without discovery, there is no innovation. Discovery of X-ray was fundamental to the first X-ray image. Discovery of positron was fundamental to the development of positron emission tomography. Discovery of accelerating techniques, technology, new technologies is fundamental. And you can clearly see on a turnaround of 20, 30 years, all the discovery make their way into our life, into our daily life. And so also the big discoveries that you have seen in the previous talks eventually will make their path all the way into our normal life, will turn into innovation, improvement of our life. This is a case of a beam that is rotating around the patient. So you see the rotating room and the patient is positioned. Again, a rotating accelerator that is made possible with the technology uh, of today. And if I can allow me a link between the previous talk 
and my talk, I'll show you the analogy between the universe, a galaxy, and a brain cell. <laughs> Since you took this picture, I thought it would be nice to <laughs> make the link. They are not so different. There are a lot of analogies between the study of a brain cell and how our universe or galaxy in the, in the universe looks like. And indeed, the two disciplines are not so far away as it sounds. They have a lot of links and a lot of interplay and synergy. Thanks a lot. And now I'll take all the questions related to technology, but not those related to medicine, because I'm not a medical doctor. Ah, <laughs> uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, sure. Just one question um, on the medicine. Sure. Um, I don't think so. I think uh, if you know how this, the plan of a treatment is done, you take these pictures, these uh, possibly multimodal pictures, interpreted by the radiologists, and you take them in a big room, a big circle of medical doctors from the different disciplines. There is the surgeon thinking about uh, asportation of a tumor. There is clearly the, the radiotherapist uh, who thinks about uh, treatment with uh, radioisotopes, and there is the chemistry who thinks of chemotherapy or alike. And really for every single individual, and this is the important, the key issue, for every case, the answer is different. For every case, either one or the other or the other is better. And the excellence is understanding, having all the tools to understand what is best, and understanding which one of the three is best. There are cases where first you need to reduce the size of the tumor, especially the satellite tumors. You cannot export it before. You cannot cut it before. There are cases where uh, there are unfortunately still tumors that are resistant to radiotherapy. You can bombard them with photons and they will be likely to multiplicate again. They go into silent mode for a few years and they start up again. So then you know it's better to remove. So the answer is not clear. And I don't think one discipline will grow on top of the other. Yeah. Yes. Right. That's, that's what we are aiming for with this uh, endoscopic project. It, it's a tool for the medical doctors to localize the tumor, to see it, to intervene. You can directly act on the tumor if you decide to either biopsy the tumor or export it, and check the effectiveness of your action. So if you have removed it, can you, you can still check if all is gone or not. <laughs> yes. that better? Okay. So you mentioned the, the use of different elementary particles. And so we went from photons to electrons to protons to alpha. You also mentioned neutrons. So my question is, what is uh, in few words the advantage of neutrons compared to protons and uh, how would you make them? I mean, how can you master uh, neutrons as well as in absence of electric field, electromagnetic field, uh, as well as we can do with, uh, with electrons and protons. I have to say I have put neutrons in because of an historical reason. Neutrons have been used before proton and ion uh, became available. The difficulty in proton and ion, I don't want to rediscuss, but it's really a technical difficulty to bring, to focus the beam on uh, the patient and to ensure the stability the stable position of the relative patient and beam. They, con they all control of the beam. Neutrons were available because of, uh, mainly at reactors, actually. The first patients have been treated at nuclear reactors in uh, experimental facilities. And neutrons are very similar to proton. Yeah. They, they deposit energy in, in depth. They can reach deeper organ. That was the old thing of trying neutrons. But by now, they are. 
Right. No, so About this obvious. focusing uh, aspect, is this Bragg effect also valid for neutrons as it is for protons? No. No, so wh where, it's a where different does type the of effect. So come? neutron interacts via strong interaction, so it has a probability to interact in matter. It does not deposit energy all the way through. So the neutron goes in the body, at some point will interact. It reaches deeper in the body than a photon, let's say, or an electron in that sense. It reaches deeper, that's why they were used initially. You have no, no real predictivity on where the, the single neutron will interact and then it deposits energy very locally. So it, it also has a sort of Bragg types or instantaneous energy deposition, but with a beam of neutron, you really spread the energy over a larger depth. The only issue of starting neutron therapy was, in, in my understanding, due to the fact that you could go deeper and treat deeper organs with less surface damage. The problem of photons is that you start to, uh, to damage the, the surface uh, of the uh, skin and the first superficial organs. And in some cases, this could be a disadvantage. But I would say nowadays, with proton available, neutron is, uh, is not relevant anymore. You have no possibility to focus them, as you said, or oh, not at the same level of uh, precision as, uh, as proton. Neutrons were used with, um, uh, with collimators. You had to collimate. Um, so the only way of uh, collimating a neutron beam, the neutron beam is coming all over, and then what you do, you have fingers creating a specific collimator for a specific organ. So you close with lead everything else, and you allow only a sp special portion to be irradiated. So you focus by collimation. Yes. Okay. Please. Oh, apart from CERN worldwide, what are the maximum uh, um, research fac facilities and, or universities uh, that do biomedical engineering or medical physics? I have to say this is probably one of the broadest field of research that you can find all over the world. And the good thing in medical uh, applications is that even with a smaller lab, you can do quite a lot. You can have a significant impact also if you are not CERN. And that's a very positive things, thing because you can spread research all over the world. Now, the key role of CERN still is and remains the fact that it concentrates knowledge and distributes tasks and kind of streamlines things because many people are repeating similar studies in parallel and it's much more effective to streamline. And that's why these very big collaborations start from CERN, but are distributed everywhere. Then I should answer to your question, country specific, if you come to Germany, um, Theo München, so Munich is a big center of knowledge in uh, detector development and uh, cancer treatment, but they are plenty. They are maybe smaller, but a small university can do quite a lot and can have a quite big impact. In Italy, I can quote you also a couple. If you're interested, I can give you a couple of links uh, offline. A question to the kind of particles you can use in radiotherapy. What would you think is, um, from the technology aspect, the most, um, yeah, the most uh, promising type of particle in terms of handling by the technology and efficiency in therapy? Luckily, I was this week in Heidelberg in this center, and I asked this question to the expert because I would not know how to answer. Um, but I just happened to discuss this. It's, it's extremely interesting because if you see it from a point of view of damage of the cell, carbon, because of the higher mass and the higher interaction, has a much higher probability to kill the cells. Problem is, it kills all the cells. And so also the the good cells in an organ have a harder time to reestablish themselves. So I was told by the expert, there is a complete variety, again, in the choice of particle, depending on the tumor, the location, the size, and the organ in which the tumor is sitting. If you want the organ to recuperate, to recover overnight, the treatment is always done in several days. You don't do one-shot treatment. This would kill the patient. So you have to go through several days, from four to 30 days of therapy. That is, you apply a little bit of dose, you kill by poisoning slowly, right? You apply a bit of dose every day, 
and you hope to kill the good and the bad cells in the same rate, but the good ones will have time overnight to reproduce, and the day after, you keep killing more and more of the bad ones. Now, this process of recuperating is much better with proton therapy, for instance, than with carbon. Carbon typically kills the probability of regeneration, also of the good cells. So if you have a very small and localized tumor, dense, you go for it with carbon is done. Carbon you cannot use on children or on infants because it's not known the effect. We don't have enough time and study to know the effect. So for children, for instance, an alternative to proton is helium, a lighter uh, isotope. A uh, lighter ion, sorry. Uh, where uh, you are much closer to proton, there is still the probability uh, that the good cells are uh, recovering. So, th again, the answer is totally organ specific, case specific, size specific. And there is no best particle, I would say. You need them both. And that's what they experience in Heidelberg with the, po uh, with the possibility to switch between proton and carbon at the moment, they want to implement helium as well, but the, probability, the, the possibility to switch between them gives them the possibility to treat patient A and patient B with the best suited for their cancer type. Yeah? So how much of this development is publicly funded and how much goes to industry? Because, you know, you, you could, when, when health... Yeah. I make you the example of Heidelberg. I, I, I don't know all the numbers. The majority has to come from publicly funded uh, research, that is clear. In this specific case, Siemens, the company, has equipped all the three rooms. They have paid completely for the rooms and for the instrumentation in the room. So from beam delivery to patient delivery, Siemens has paid all the rest. All the rest, and you know from my energy physics experiment, I mean, the, the detector and the accelerator, that is a quite large factor in ratio. All the rest is publicly funded. The building, the accelerator, the research behind it is publicly funded. So it's still quite a lot. The problem is at the moment it's still not making money. That, that is the biggest problem. Nobody is paying for this type of treatment. A treatment costs about 20,000 euro, a full treatment of a patient. And the insurance companies are willing to cover 15,000 at max. And then the question is how much throughput do you have? How fast do you go through patients? And as I said, I was really this week uh, in Heidelberg, they have about 60 patients per day in three rooms. So it's still not breaking even. It still costs more than it makes money. Can I allow that question first? Uh, it's okay. It's okay. Good. Then I come here. How much efficient is in uh, proton therapy? Um, yes. I hate not having this backup slide. I, I saw this, uh, these numbers uh, recently. So the, um, the five years, after five years, the survival rate for a given study, and few studies have been made, not so many, for a given type of tumor, after five years, the expectation of survival has increased from photon therapy, 20%, to proton therapy, 50% and carbon therapy, 70%. For one given study, okay? And in the case of a chemistry therapy? No, this would not be possible to treat with, uh, with chemotherapy. So those were cases where you needed specific, where chemotherapy would not react for some biological reason of this organ. So you take a specific case that must be treated with radiotherapy, must be treated with radiotherapy, and you treat it with photons, 20% survival rate, 50% survival rate if you treat it with proton, and then you have another control sample treated with carbon, 70%, which is significant. And that was the study made at GSI in Germany that convinced people to build this machine. So that was the study case to build this machine. There are for sure more study cases. Yes. Just a question to the mechanism behind this different type of particles which are used for therapy. So you mentioned that some of them um, work via DNA damage. 
um, do the carbon and the proton therapy work also via DNA damage, or is it different? Yes. No, no, it's, it's all exactly the same. So what if you it's do, DNA you, damage, then yeah. the resistance to therapy becomes of DNA repair mechanisms in the cells, right? I, I think the, the distinction between photons and protons, let's take these two options, is in the local amount of energy that you deposit. A photon is most likely to interact with maybe one cell in the DNA, one, uh, sorry, one um, atom in the DNA and break that one because the energy deposited by a photon is limited in space. A proton is a highly uh, heavy ionizing particle. It will damage many atoms in a row. So it's most likely to cut the DNA line, break it, the double strand break, which is the cutting of, the complete cutting of the DNA line. Carbon even more so. Yeah, this is, I, I come from uh, the drug development point of view, so I'm personally a pharmacist here, pharmacologist. Okay. And um, what, what we think about to improve uh, radiotherapy is that we combine it with um, DNA repair, um, inhibition of DNA repair enzymes for double strand DNA yeah. break uh, repair enzymes, for instance. So that could then further improve um, what you told about the efficiency of therapy in increasing yes. the overall survival time. Yes. So five years after surgery, you have 50%. Um, and, and this could further be improved with this combination. If you have a way to inhibit the repair, if you have a way to tell this cell after you have been damaged, apoptosis, so die, don't repair but die, this would be the enzyme or the, the substance that you can put in to improve the effectiveness of radiotherapy. That's an excellent field of research indeed. <laughs> okay. I guess I have to leave you free. I don't know if there are more questions uh, or... You can also come down to me and we can keep discussing all the time. I don't have to go for lunch, so I'm happy to continue. But those who want to migrate out can freely migrate. One more. <laughs> Side effects to the proton therapy? Side effects? Um, no, I mean, not particular side effects that are not there already with other therapies. You mean. You don't lose your hair. You well, it depends obviously where you irradiate. If you irradiate the brain, you lose your hair. Yeah, but this is really not. <laughs> I think as a side effect, this is really mine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure, if you irradiate. Okay, thanks a lot <laughs> for the many questions as well.